may know, has been working in my lab as a colleague since 2009. Dr. Levine tells, tells me that he was born in Toulouse, France. And according to Wikipedia, <laughs> I had to look it up. Toulouse, France lies on the bank on the, of the river Carole. Close enough. Okay. It's about 366 miles south of Paris, so it's located in the south of France. So we can ask him about that later. Halfway between, the, halfway between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, it's the fifth largest city in France, but it's home to the third largest student population, which is quite a nice environment to grow up in. And the city is known for its uh, biotechnology. Uh, Dr. Levy stayed at home for his degrees. He got his bachelor's, master's, and PhD from the University of Paul Sabatier in Toulouse. His uh, BA was in physiology, genetics, cellular and molecular biology. Um, he finished that in 1998. In 1999, he finished his master's in molecular genetics and cellular biology. And finally, he obtained his PhD in plant sciences, working in the area of molecular and cell cellular biology. Um, his PhD research focused on genes involved in nod factor signal transduction and nodulation in metacognito. And during this period, he also spent six months at the University of Wageningen. Thank you. Thank you. In the Netherlands. After he graduated in uh, uh, 2003, he worked for two years uh, for a biotechnology company. He went to the dark side and worked for industry. And there he worked on developing tools to improve the protection of genetically modified urban car crops. Um, from there, he traveled across the Atlantic uh, to Ithaca, New York. Um, to work on a very interesting project that he's going to talk to you about today, and that is the genes, identification of genes that are involved in arbuscular mycorrhizae symbioses using RNA I silencing. And uh, he had, stemming from that work, uh, three major publications, two of them in science so far. So this is, uh, the work that he did there was quite influential. From Ithaca, New York, as many of you know, he traveled with Dr. Tim Rinke here to Texas A&M University in 2009. And after a very brief stint in uh, biochemistry, I snagged him uh, for my lab. Um, and since then, he's been the leader of the Deepership Project that he's going to talk to you about today. And he has helped me establish colleagues with a number, or collaborations with a number of you that are present here today. Um, I would just like to add that uh, I'm very happy to have Dr. Levine in my lab. We share an interest in uh, symbiosis, both uh, uh, microbial plant and microbial insect. Um, we probably also are maybe the only two people to have ever played rugby in an organized fashion. And uh, share an interest in professional soccer, as all of you know, that have ever stopped in my lab and seen a soccer game. Um, he's been one of, my, one of my very best colleagues. Uh, he's helped me train three undergraduate students, three graduate students. He's been tremendously productive over his last his past two years. He has three publications and is likely to get seven more. And with that, I will let him talk to you about a tale of two symbioses: the arbuscular mycorrhizae and zebra chip story. Thank you, Howdy. Thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> Coming to the talk, to my talk. So when I start to work on this topic, when I get sick and prepare this talk, she asked me to talk about my previous talk and the work I'm doing in our lab. So I had to come with a title that will cover both of the topics, and that's why I, I chose a tale of two symbioses and muscular mycorrhiza and zebra chip. And uh, so why do I use symbiosis? So what's the definition of symbiosis? Symbiosis is it was used first in 1877 by Bennett, and it described a close and often long-term interaction between two different biological species. And among the scientific community, there is two, there are two schools, one that want to use symbiosis only for interaction that are mutualistic, that means that are beneficial for both of the organs. And other people use symbiosis for interaction that can be commercialistic or parasitic. And in this case, the interaction it can be no effect on one of the partners or bad effect on one of the partners. 
So um, Betsy wanted me to give a little background on what I did before, but she just did, so I, I'm going to repeat what she just said. So my interest when I started to do science, well, the interaction in between plant and microbe, and in particular cell biosis, I've been uh, trained in molecular biology, genetics, and cell biology, and my goal was to understand the mechanism of this interaction, maybe to apply it for agriculture, but also there is also a scientific question as ecological or evolution. So the, in my talk today, I'm going to first talk about the beneficial interaction of muscular mycorrhizae and legumes. And in the second part, I will talk about the branching of the living species lab. So I did my PhD on population. I did my PhD in France, in Toulouse, and uh, I work on medical gutron capula and in the interaction with rhizobiont. So this uh, cell biosis is, a, is always called modulation, but it's like the official name is more nitrogen fixing cell biosis. And uh, I will talk a little bit about that along the talk, and I will explain that later. Then I work. I was supposed to work, in a, I worked in a company named Biogema, and I was supposed to do upstream research to and to field crop. And uh, part of the business of this company was to put some GMO in the field. And uh, it was a really limited part. And uh, so at the time I was there, there was a collaboration with public institutions to do field trials because what we, the effect you see of GMO plants in greenhouse can be different from what you see in the field. So you have to test it in the field. And we follow all the security measures to do the field trial in Europe, but there are a lot of, lot of people in Europe that don't like GMO. And so these people came and destroyed all the way, and I was involved in a lot of protecting these things and confronting these people. And there was three lawsuits at the time I was there, so I was involved in the lawsuit. I was involved in the communication with the people. And I put this picture of this guy, because he is quite famous for fighting a lot of things that he doesn't like in Europe. His name is Jose Bobe, and I'm gonna tell you all I have been crossing his road quite a few times. So that was the first time when he destroyed the book really. Then I moved to uh, Ithaca, New York, to do a postdoc in Maya Arison Lab. And now I work on Abuscular Microbes and Biosis. So the uh, the institute is called Boyce Thompson Institute. Boyce Thompson was uh, an American soldier that went to the first world war, and when he came back in the US, he said, soon this country is going to be 50 million people, and we have to find a way to produce food for all of them. And so <laughs> right now, this planet is over 7 billion people, and I think we still have the same problem. So he gave all his wealth to this institute, to, um, to try to find solution for producing enough food for all these people. And I really like this picture of the Boston Sun Institute because in uh, upstate New York, that's pretty much the way you have to grow, to use the artificial light and greenhouse to grow, to grow plant. Then I came to uh, Texas CNM &M and joined Betsy's lab, and that will be the second part of my talk on Zebrachi. So, <coughs> Uh, so, on the previous year of my career, I worked on symbiosis interaction, and to study symbiosis interaction, there is one plant model that has been developed for fruit symbiosis. Um, this plant model is named Medica gotron Catula. It's a lay, it belongs to the family of the legume. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with plant model, plant model is a plant that grow easily in greenhouse and in a lab, and that you can manipulate easily, and so for which a lot of molecular and genetic tools have been developed. Uh, the medical goat from Catula is also a crop, it, uh, but it's not used as a crop only in Australia. So, and it's a, it's a cross related to one plant. In plant, the two main symbioses that are studied are arbuscular mycorrhiza and nodulation. And there is a, some, a lot of differences between these two interactions, but also some similarity. The uh, main difference are the arbuscular mycorrhiza is done by a fungi and in this plant. The nodulation is done by a bacteria interacting with the plant. 
the most of the plant species that grow on the surface of Earth are able to do the mycorrhiza symbiosis, whereas the population is restricted to only the legumes. The mycorrhiza is a very ancient symbiosis, and this, uh, there is this hypothesis that it probably helped plants to colonize the surface of the land. The nodulation is much more recent symbiosis. There is no organogenesis in uh, mycorrhiza, whereas in nodulation there is the development of a new organ, and this new organ is called the nodosity or nodule. The mycorrhiza symbiosis, so in, uh, in this symbiosis, it has to be beneficial, beneficial for both of the organism. So the plant is going to provide, in both of the case, carbon to the microorganism, and in exchange, the, the microorganism is <coughs> giving, uh, in the case of the mycorrhiza, phosphorus, nitrogen, and in the case of nodulation, and it's, that's why nodulation is very famous, it's a huge amount of nitrogen. It is, uh, there is uh, this uh, scientific study that showed that the amount of nitrogen fixed by legumes through the nodulation is as important as the amount of nitrogen fixed by other crops through the fertilization. Um, the, the last the difference is that uh, the mycorrhiza has a low level of specificity, which means that uh, any fungi can almost colonize any plant, or there is almost very low restriction on plant colonization. Whereas the nodulation is very specific, and one given bacteria will colonize only one given type of legume. And um, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a major uh, discovery that some mutants of the plants that were not able to do modulation were all taken either to the mycorrhiza. And that means that there is some mechanism in the plant that are concerned in both symbiosis. The effect of the mycorrhiza symbiosis on plants is quite spectacular. So if you grow, for example, here the green onion on um, on the media that is limited in phosphate, uh, phosphate, you can see that the plants that are not inoculated with fungi are growing very poorly, whereas the plants that are inoculated with fungi grow much better. How does the mycorrhiza are developed on the roots? Uh, fungi spore is going to recognize some compounds exuded by the roots, and that's going to use the germination of the spore and the formation of this hyphae. The hyphae is going to grow up to meeting with the roots, and on the surface of the root is going to develop this structure, this particular structure called appressorium. On this structure, the uh, fungi is going to be able to penetrate inside the roots. When it reaches the cortical cell of the root, it will going to form this very particular structure, which is named arbuscule. So arbuscule means like a tree, and it's a highly branched structure, and that's the main structure in the Mycorrhiza symbiosis because it's uh, the, this very highly branched structure will permit to extend the network of exchange between the plant and the plant organs. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the nodulation. So you have to know that in the last 25 years, a lot of effort have been done on nodulation in molecular biology and in genetics, and a lot of what has been discovered on nodulation have been then applied for research on mycorrhiza. So I'm going to uh, explain to you what we know about modulation and how it inspired the research or directed the research that has been done on mycorrhiza. So I think it was uh, 25 years ago that a very uh, striking discovery was made in that uh, the, there is a real exchange signal between the plant and the bacteria before the interaction occurs. So the, the, both of the organisms are talking to each other. What you have to know is, in this case of symbiosis, it is very important for both of the organisms to know if it works to do the symbiosis. You know, the plant is going to pay for what the, the microorganism is going to give it to us. To, to so, uh, before they enter this interaction, there is this signal exchange, which is, so the plant roots exude flavonoid compounds, and these compounds are able to induce in the bacteria the expression of some specific genes called not genes. And these genes are responsible for the synthesis and the secretion 
of a molecule of hypokitone in the saccharide, that is called not factor. These not factor are themselves when purified and applied to a living plant, and with some very high level of specificity, they are able to induce the formation of new organ into the roots, which are the molecule. <coughs> so, as I told you before, this dialogue is very important. And so all the people then ask, uh, how does this, this uh, uh, mechanism is described by the plant and how does the plant understand that? And the way to, uh, to try to understand how do you go from the not factor to the formation of the nodule was to generate mutant. So uh, the last community of scientific made mutant and then they moved from the and identify different mutants of plants that were unable to do ovulation. And then they look for the phenotype in this mutant and identify different physiological response or cellular response at the modification of the root hair or uh, calcium spike in signaling. And that's the way they were able to put an order on all these genes play a role in detecting the blood And for the mycorrhiza, it's the same. You have a mid factor. The mid factor was identified last year. It was published in the Nature of January 2011. So to tell you the, the gap between mycorrhiza and the duration in terms of the, 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 the discovery. But uh, importantly, what was discovered is that some of these genes that were involved in the modulation and enabled to the modulation were also involved in mycorrhiza. <coughs> Development. And so, what, uh, what does that mean in terms of evolution is that probably the same mechanisms in plants are necessary to develop both of the symbiosis, and or there is the control point in plants to develop the symbiosis that are similar. To, uh, to identify the new genes involved in mycorrhiza, the strategy which they are conducted in uh, my Horizon lab is an RNAi study of the symbiosis. So for you that are not familiar with, with RNAi, RNAi is a technique that enables to switch off a gene that is normally expressed. It's, almost, it's not the same as generating a mutant, but the effect is quite similar. So we tested 1500 RNAi from which was a target from literature of ESD profiling. And uh, this project was developed in collaboration with the laboratory of Steve Gant at the Spain University. And so, how to generate a large number of these RNAi silence fruits and uh, what, which system do we use? And I think that's quite interesting for people in horticulture is that as we are looking at the symbiosis that's occurring at the root, what we are only interested to look at is the root, basically. We almost don't care about what's going on on the upper part. And uh, so the way to generate this RNAi was to transform the roots. And we do that using a bacteria that is called Agrobacterium rhizogenes. What we do is we cut the tip of a, a young seedling. We inoculate the tips uh, with anobacterium mesogenes containing the vector that's going to produce the RNAi that we are expecting. We are going to generate transgenic roots on selected media. And then we can transplant this plant into soil. And three weeks later, we inoculate with fungi the roots. And three weeks later, we harvest the root and stain with antibody to look at the, the spreading of the mycorrhiza symbiosis. So here is a picture of a mycorrhiza. So what you see is it's stained with antibody. And the, what you see is the eye feel around the roots. And these very these, these strong squares are actually the arbuscules. If you have any question, you can interrupt me. So there is a gene family that we uh, picked very early to look for genes. And it's a gene family that all of you should be very familiar with. This is a grass family gene. And why do I say it's, you should be familiar? Because it's a uh, bone log, as when we selected these uh, plants, it was working actually with this plant that are related in the grass genes. Uh, it's a family that is named after the three first member, and this fa the family is linked to its uh, functional domain, which is the grass domain. 
but most of the time we contain a regulatory domain which is very valuable. Um, there is two in remit with much functional protein protein interaction. They are nuclear localized and they are transcription regulator. In the Arabidopsis, which is the plant that most, the super plant model, that's also a plant that are taking inspiration from Arabidopsis, there are 33 members of the, of the grass family. And we identified two genes that were relatively close to the one identified in modulation. But that's not the one I'm going to talk about today. But there is a subclass that we got very interested in, and it's called the DELA, the DELA subclass of this group. And what's particular about these genes is that in their regulatory domain, there is a DELA domain. And this DELA domain has been demonstrated to mediate the binding of Giberelic acid coactivator. So these proteins are in the Giberelic acid pathway. And what you have to know is also that this DELA domain is very conserved among all the DELA all over the plant. It's a, it's a very specific domain that has very conserved function. So what happens when we do a, a HANA eye of this gene in our system? So the, the plant we transform with a vector control, they don't show, they show the regular phenotype of our muscular mycorrhiza, the fungi colonize the root. It's spreading all along the roots, and there is a lot of fungus we get looking all over. When we transform with all uh, the, uh, the gene that we wanted to silence, what we see is that a lot of infection units that are not able to spread in the root, and this picture is really uh, striking because you can see that the fungi look like it's tried to it tried several times at the same place to colonize the root, but it was unable to develop a fully functional as uh, some viruses. Here are more pictures where the fungi is able to spread a little bit more, but there, what you can notice is that there is no arbuscule developing. And arbuscule are the critical points for doing the exchange between plant and the fungi. We measure the size of this, uh, of this infection unit, and they were much smaller than you don't control. So the infection unit seems to not spread and are shorter, and the arbuscule are unable to develop properly when we sign up this gene. For those of you that are interested in more molecular stuff, we checked that the gene was, uh, this gene was actually silenced in these in this roots, and we did that by RT-PCR. And now let me come back to the GA. So most of you are talking out what is the GA. It's a very important growth hormone in plant. It's a gibberellic acid. It was actually discovered in fungi. There is uh, 150 GA that have been identified, but there are only four of them that are functional. And they are uh, uh, involved in stem elongation, leaf elongation, cell, cell divisions. They are involved in the growth of the plant. And I know Matt can like a different picture to teach this to the, the students about GA, but these are uh, the simplest graph, grape, and uh, uh, if you don't apply GA to your brain, the brain are going to grow very small. And the one that we show you by in a grocery store have seen a lot of GA treatment. Because the, the seeds are responsible for the synthesis of the GA. How does the GA work on the cellular level? What, uh, what's happening in the cell is that you have a DELA protein that is inhibiting the growth of the plant that is present in the cell. And when there is a GA signal coming to the cell, this signal is going to induce the degradation of this protein. And so you don't have anymore the inhibition of the growth and the plant is growing up. So we did a GA treatment to a plant to look at the effect on mycorrhiza cephalosis. And the first thing we notice is that the shoots are growing really big, really fast, less than three weeks of treatment, of, that was seven days of treatment. The, the shoot are really big. We look also at the root, and you can notice that the roots of the plant are very different when you are treated with GA. The, the root of a regular plant are uh, more dense and more compact, and there is much, uh, they are much bigger and they are more secondary roots, whereas the plant GA treated are very thin and less secondary roots. And what is the effect on the mycorrhizae? 
Symbiosis is, is that, so in a controlled plant, there is no effect, we still see a lot of arbuscule developing, whereas in the, in the one treated with GA, there is no more arbuscule developing. And so that's a very similar phenotype that uh, what we observe when we do the RNA silencing of the number one. So I will, uh, want to remind you that the effect of GA is to induce the description of the data protein. So what we did next is uh, we overexpress a DELA protein where we remove the DELA protein. And so if this protein will not be any more targeted for degradation by the GA hormone. And so we repeat the experiment where we do the GA treatment on this plant to transform this overexpression of the delta DELA protein. And what we see is that on the control, there is a uh, growth of the arbus cube, whereas on the GA treating, the vector control, there is no arbuscule, and the, the plant where we overexpress the delta de la, de la protein, there is restoration of the uh, arbuscule phenotype. So, uh, the conclusion of this work and the perspective on this work are uh, that, uh, so in medical autoncatula, it seems that gibberellic acid inhibits the development of the symbiosis at the arbuscule development step. The phenotype of cell in the GA treated root and the phenotype in the Dilaguan RNA roots are very similar. And uh, that we identified a DELAC protein that is a negative regulator and that is necessary for the full establishment of this symbiosis. So when we uh, step back at the plant level, what does that mean? You have this hormone that is crucial for the plant development and the plant growth. And you have the plant with like, should I do this symbiosis with this fungi, how much is going to cost me? What is the fungi going to give me? How much should I give? How much carbon should I give to the plant? And so it seems really logical, but the growth hormone that is controlling the growth of the plant is also going to have an impact on uh, choosing to do the symbiosis. So the, now I'm going to switch to the second topic, which is uh, what I've been doing in uh, the Department of Horticulture and working on the zebra chip disease. So uh, zebra chip disease is a very new disease, and so we are not yet at the point to study the mechanism of the development of the disease, but what was needed when I joined the lab was to develop new tools to better understand what's going on in this disease. So, is it a symbiosis or is it is not a symbiosis? That's the question. So here, the uh, partner in this interaction involves a bacteria, which is candidatus liver bacteria. And uh, this bacteria is named candidatus because we haven't been able to grow it uh, yet. The plant partner this time are solanese fruit plants, and in the lab we work with potato and tomato. And to make it interesting, there is a sub partner which is an insect, and it's a seed eater. Let me give you a little bit of background on potato. Potato are originally from southern Peru. They are the world's first largest food crop. There is an average consumption worldwide of seventy-three pounds per annum per. People and in the US, this consumption is 126 pounds. The China is the top producer, but the US has an important production. And the potato was really important also in the history of Europe and some the history of the US because the boom of the population in Europe came when potato was introduced in Europe. And the large amount of immigration to the US from Europe came when. The disease, the disease appeared in Europe on potato, and they were unable to produce as much potato as it used to be. So, um, this disease was first detected in 1994 in Mexico, and it appeared in Texas and reported in Texas in 2000. Now it has been reported as far as Nebraska or Washington State in the north of the US and west as California. The symptom of this disease on the leaves and on the aerial, plant of the, uh, aerial part of the plant are variable in that uh, a lot of other diseases can induce the same kind of symptom. But the, the tuber symptom of this disease are very distinctive. And in particular, when you fry this, uh, this potato, 
what's happening at NC Potato, you have these golden, nice looking chips, whereas in the uh, thick or infected potato plant, you have this pattern of a darkening in the chips, and that's where the name comes from, zebra chip. So the, this, this disease has been reported so far in Mexico, USA, all over Central America, and New Zealand. And the economic laws are very important. In New Zealand, it has been over 100 million of dollars for the last two years, and there is one of the programs of New Zealand that, that will stop to grow potato. And uh, the government of Australia also raised a high concern on the introduction of the disease in, in, in this territory. As I, uh, the, battle, the agent responsible for this disease is this bacteria, and that is the bacteria serum. This bacteria cannot be cultured. The uh, host range include, so it's the somanaceae, and it's include the tomato, pepper, and a lot of uh, weed of the somanaceae family. It is transmitted by this guy, the bacteria cocerelli, and the transmission of the disease has been demonstrated by grafting and seed feeding. Uh, interestingly, there are uh, other plant diseases that are appearing that are uh, similar to this zebra chip disease, in that they are also transmitted by psyllid and they are also caused by bacteria from candidatus. The three diseases are the HLB or Guanglong bean, which is citrus greening, and this disease has been reported in China, Brazil, and the USA. In Europe, a new disease called carotillo, which is uh, here healthy plant and here an infected plant, and it has been reported in Europe and the Middle East, and there is also a similar disease in a pear tree. The outline of the DC project I'm going to talk about today. So, as I told you, this is a relatively new disease, and so we wanted to develop new tools to better understand this. Somebody. This disease. So there is a project uh, in which we worked under the direction of uh, Dr. Gross from plant pathology at XSLM. We then, uh, in our lab, studied the pathogen movement and disease development. And we also participate in selection of tolerant cultivar with Dr. Miller and Tim Schoening. So the uh, when I joined the lab, there was a lot of people that were complaining because the, uh, there, there was no reliable way to detect the disease. And the, there was some primer developed to do PCR for the detection of the disease, but people were not satisfied with this primer. So one of the first projects we developed with Dr. Gross was to design new primer on the sequence that were available of the bacteria. So I, this bacteria, we cannot culture it, so it's not easy to access its genome. And uh, so we developed two sets of primer. We test this primer on a different infected plant, and this primer seems to be efficient. We look at the specificity of this primer by testing them on infected tissue of, by zebra chip, but also on infected tissue with other diseases, and then this primer seems highly specific. We also test the sensitivity of this primer on different concentrations of the pathogen, and we see that the new primer developed were much more sensitive than the previous primer. <coughs> so this, this primer were recently published in the plant disease uh, Another technology that, we, uh, that farmer would we really like to have is to be able to do diagnostic on-site, diagnostic in the field. And there is this new technology named LAMP PCR, in which you can, with a very easy setup, where it's only one hour incubation at one temperature, you can, uh, you can have a diagnostic, a very reliable diagnostic. But for that, it was uh, uh, necessary to develop a primer that are specific for zebra chip. And so the way it works is that you see in the affected tissue, you're going to have this reaction where right? it's looking green, and when you put it under a UV light, you see that only the fluorescent tubes are the ones that are positive. And, um, you, uh, in the lab, the other thing that people were complaining about is that the, uh, it was very uh, 
variable. We could sample a different tissue of a plant that we knew that was infected, and we find that the tissue sometimes are affected, uh, you detect the presence of the pathogen, and sometimes you don't detect the presence of the pathogen. And we knew that Candidatus is a fluent limited pathogen, and it, it has been reported already that some fluent limited viruses may generally have a very predictable translocation pattern into the plant. So, to improve the early detection of liver bacteria, we conducted the same kind of study where to follow the movement of the bacteria into the plant. And we also compare this movement of uh, the pathogen into cultivars that were susceptible against cultivars that are tolerant for the bacteria of the disease. So the way we uh, conducted this experiment is we put two seed in a clean cage on the middle tier branch of potato or tomato plants, and we let them sex feed for one week. After one week, we cut the branch where the insects are feeding, and which we then sample uh, top, middle, and bottom leaf to check if we were able to detect the bacteria. And we conduct this experiment for eight weeks. And we check for the presence of the bacteria via PCR and quantitative PCR. The way we grow potato is basically we put a tuber or half a tuber in the soil. And for this experiment, we let two stem grow in our pot. And then we we'll talk about that later. So the development of the disease is uh, in the two plants susceptible of tolerance. So the tolerant plants are coming from the selection program from Dr. Miller. The, uh, after about four weeks after infection, so that's at week one when we remove the insect from the plant, there is no symptom observable. But after four weeks, we start to see on the infected stem some uh, uh, phenotypes that are a sign of the disease, and it's this curling and purpling of the upper leaves of the plant. Whereas in the tolerant line, we don't see any symptom. When we did the PCR to detect the uh, pathogen, we can see that uh, on the both on the susceptible and on the tolerant, it see the pathogen was detected on the top tissue of the plant which means that the pathogen had the time to move into the plant and to go on the upper part of the plant by a four week. And what's interesting is we see it on the susceptible and also on the tolerant. On the tolerant, we didn't see any symptom, but the pathogen was uh, moving and uh, developing as good as in the susceptible plant. So the pathogen seems to do as well in the tolerant and susceptible. By week six, basically, in you know, a infested susceptible line, the plant was dead, whereas in the tolerant, you could see the symptoms spread. We look also at the second stem. Remember, I told you we let two stems grow into the plant, and what we see on the, from the symptom on the second stem is that there is a delay in the apparition of the symptom, and the symptom appears by week five on the susceptible, and by week seven, the, the plant was not doing really good. And uh, on the tolerant line, there was also this kind of delay of, on the progress of the disease. And also by week six, we could detect the, the first symptom, and by week eight, the symptom uh, spread. And uh, what's inter also interesting is that we detect the pathogen, the RPCR, in the second step by week, five, week four as well. So it doesn't seem that there is a delay in the movement of the pathogen from one stem to the other stem. So the, this pathogen seems to be able to move really fast and both in susceptible and tolerant plants that we are violating by. We did the same experiment in tomato, and basically we found similar results in that by week three or four, we are able to detect the pathogen in the upper part of the plant, mostly. So by, you need at least to wait three or four weeks to be able to detect the pathogen by conventional PCR. Um, and what we see is that by the end, the pathogen was detected by all of the plant. On, the, on tomato, the symptom are in this type of experiment where there is a limited insect per plant, the symptom was not as dramatic as when we put a lot of insect on the plant of what you actually previously on the potato. 
So what are the conclusion of this study is the pathogen appeared to move in a predictable manner. We were not able to detect the pathogen by regular test PCR until three weeks after a test and testing the plant. We detect the pathogen first in the upper limb, suggesting transmutation nets may follow a source to sink movement toward the new forming leaf. In this young growing plant, which part of the plant needs the more carbon to grow? It's the upper part where the new leaves are developing. And so that's probably where the bacteria is growing as well. And uh, we also demonstrate that the pathogen is able to translocate from one stem to another stem. We also did a QPCR analysis to try to see if we were more sensitive in the detection of the pathogen, and if we were more sensitive in the detection, we also need to be right able to detect it before we um, We the, the QPCR data show that with the time the title of the bacteria into the plant tissue goes up, but it's also because we are removing the tissue every time, so we cannot go back to the same tissue. So, we can also see a little fluctuation. So this experiment showed that uh, in one week, the pathogen was able to go from the leaf of infection that we removed to colonize all the plants, basically. Uh, this pathogen is able to multiply into the plant because for three weeks we don't detect it, and after four weeks we are able to detect it. And, uh, so far, no, plant, no resistant plant has really been identified, and I, all plants with a high insect pressure or specific insect pressure can be affected. And long term strategic control for this disease will need to uh, investigate more about the mechanism of the development of this disease. Then uh, last year, we got involved in a project of, uh, of uh, variety screening with Dr. Miller Group. And, uh, so Dr. Miller provided us uh, six uh, lines that it selected as a top choice for showing lower symptom or no symptom of regression. And the experiment we conducted is uh, that was in West Laco with blood. Yeah. And um, the experiment we conducted is we had uh, two cages in which we have the six entry that showed the best tolerance of resistance to the disease, in which we mix this entry with a susceptible plant, Atlantic, which is here in Europe, and we randomized the, the plant around in the cage with always an Atlantic for three other resistant plants. And we put five insects in the middle of this every fourth choice. And uh, so we went to harvest the potato at the end of the season and fried the potato. And there was one entry that for all the 10 plants we grew in these cages didn't show any symptom of zebra chip on the chips, on the chips. Here on the Atlantic tuber, they all show this zebra chip pattern. And one of three show zero symptom of zebra chip. So that was a very encouraging selection for future breeding strategy. For resistance to zebra There were three other entry, New York, BTX, and the Texas entry that have a, uh, some level of potato tuber with no symptom. Uh, what uh, so why some cultivars seems to be tolerant to ZC? Is it an insect preference? Does the insect went to this uh, to this cultivar and probe it? But we don't like it and move away. We don't know. Uh, is it plant tolerance? Can the plant live perfectly with the bacteria inside? Or is it both of the of, of this strategy or is it something else? So to check if the insect feed on this cultivar, what we did is uh, we did PCR of the tuber that were negative and the tu uh, showing no DC symptom. And none of these tuber seems to have a uh, legal bacteria. We also did a QPCR on this tuber, and five out of 10 showed that the bacteria was present. So that means this plant has been infected. We don't know, the, the time in the tuber was very low, and we don't know if that's the explanation from not showing symptom or if it's part of the explanation. And um, so it will be interesting to try to do a little bit more study on studying the mechanism of this resistance. And so what are the future research 
undertaking this, uh, or, to, or developing this aspect. We would like to test so this entry and ETX for the testing the symptom development and the translocation of the bacteria. We would like to conduct experiment in the lab. We uh, we are also trying to see if mycorrhiza, as it is the main symptom of these diseases, destroying the tuber or showing this pattern in the tuber, we would like to see if mycorrhiza could improve the resistance to these diseases. Uh, we are in collaboration with the laboratory in entomology here at Texas CNM. We are studying the effect of the bacteria on the insect because the, the, the insect has to carry the bacteria to have that kind of an effect on the insect. And we would like to analyze the transcriptome of potato and tomato in the interaction with the insect and in the interaction with the bacteria. Thank you very much. What causes the browning? Is it phenolics? It's a, it's a sugar relocation, I think. Well, but the browning occurs even before the potatoes are cooked. Not always. Okay. Not always. It's, and sometimes there is this browning in the potatoes before the cooking, and it's not the browning. It can be oh, on okay. the uh, on the. So for the varieties that seem like they don't show symptomology by the zebra chip and African, is there, if you were to inoculate those, and I know these experiments haven't, haven't been done yet, but would you predict that there would be effects on other clone uh, limited organisms? On the resistant plant? Yeah. No. Uh, I don't know. We uh, we try to look at uh, at this effect on also for limited, uh, uh, but we didn't. Uh, we found also one percent analysis of the potato, but were um, not really modified by uh, the presence of the zebra chip. But I don't know also why probably. Yeah. Along the same lines, have you tried maintaining a civil colony on the farm? Right. So we are we are trying to grow the tolerant variety. So the, the, if you mean the New York or the BTX that we tested before, we can maintain a, a colony on the New York or the BTX. Yes, but on the new one we don't have uh, we don't have enough seeds to, to do that already. Yes, so we are propagating the light. Yeah. Have you looked at any uh, native uh, mycorrhiza of the potatoes here in production systems in Texas? I've never looked at what, sorry? Have you looked, have you tried to isolate any native mycorrhiza in commercial potato oh. production systems in Texas? No, I haven't tried. Okay. Just, just as a general comment, because uh, with potatoes, potatoes is one of the highest inputs of all the vegetable crops. And one of the problems in the States has always been trying to identify Mycorrhiza in, in very low input situations. In Peru, for instance, we had a project of 3,900 meters and it was a very subsistence level. And we were working with an isoflavonoid and we did get some significant uh, growth differences in mycorrhiza. But a lot of times, your commercial systems here in the States, they use such heavy levels of fertilizer, particularly phosphorus, which you, as you know, gets involved in mycorrhizal colonization. That the practicality of that could be a, could be a problem. So we, what we, I tried is there is this company in Canada that uh, said uh, mycorrhiza inoculum, uh -huh. and I tried to uh, to inoculate the potato with that and it worked. But uh, yeah, we have a look at uh, natural, and oh. it will be very really interesting because uh, right. mycorrhiza help also with the water limiting conditions. So yeah, potato potato will be mycorrhiza, but yeah. If you work at the fertility levels, there are a lot of commercial operations that yeah. suppresses the suppresses yeah. the mycorrhiza. Just as a general comment too, like this, uh, the people in Florida, the industry is really concerned that there's going to be any type of citrus industry in the next 10 or 15 years with the, the, the citrus greening problem that's going on right now. What's what are some of the similarities between the zebra zebra chip and the citrus greening, and and how might some of the uh, approaches to Tackling those problems. Get rid of the CD. Get rid of the CD. 
probably would be the best, the best way to not propagate the bacteria. Uh, apparently, the blur with the viral message means they say that they can kind of contain the disease with uh, heavy fertilizer and, and uh, helping the plant to grow, to grow it out. But uh, yeah, right now, I don't know if we identify the variety and the genotype that is resistant, that would be the best long term solution. But right now, the best is to get rid of the CV. And that's what the potato industry wants to do in Texas. They don't want to see any seed. So this year, there was uh, the weather condition we know. And uh, heavy, heavy treatment, chemical treatment against chili, and they didn't see many chili this year, so they are happy about that. But that's not going to be a long term solution either. So. Go ahead. Are you sure it's a bacteria? You keep growing the bacteria, but then you said it wasn't, uh, you can't grow in, yeah. uh, in culture. You sure? You are sure? You are sure it's bacteria? Uh, it, it, so no, it has been kind of sequenced, but you can discuss about that, and uh, yes, we are sure it's a bacteria. So there is a lot of people, especially in Mexico, that think it's, uh, it's a pato phytoplast, because apparently there is a phytoplast that is uh, giving the same kind of symptom on the plant, on the aerial plant, and so there is still some people that want to define the the phytoplast, but what we look at in the lab is home CD population and all plants, it's the bacteria. Uh, yeah. so, so, so another another speculation question was was kind of builds on the fact that I mean I've never heard of Candidatus the bear bacteria until about three or four years ago. Also we have it in citrus, we have it in potato. So it transmitted. Do you think that this bacteria was inherently endogenous in, in silence and some, something happened? Did something trigger? Or what, how do you have that? How would you speculate as the origin of some of the, the symptomology that we see on multiple and, and very diverse crops? Yeah. And yeah. It, it seems to be the case for a lot of uh, diseases that are appearing on plants and transmitted by insects and that are bacteria, right? Because people in plant pathology used to study soil borne diseases, fungi, or bacteria, or virus that are transmitted by insects. But now it seems that there is more and more diseases that are bacteria and vectored by insects. And um, according to the data I've seen on insects, and that it seems that the bacteria affect the rate of reproduction of the insect. So, yeah. so it doesn't seem logical that this bacteria was hosted by the insect and somehow went into the, into the plant. I will probably think maybe it's some kind of wild variety that were hosting that. And uh, there is a lot of movement of the insect which is changing the wood climate. That maybe were not present before, and maybe that helps to disseminate the disease to, to crops. That could be my hypothesis, but I don't have any. Sarah? How do you think the micro-ising will affect the resistance to the So it has been shown for, uh, for other disease. I don't remember right now which. It was with a bacteria. And it was in tomato, but I don't remember right that moment. That uh, mycorrhiza was uh, limiting the spreading of the symptom in the plant. So the thing is, uh, because of the mycorrhiza can be very beneficial for the growth of the plant, there can be a competition also with the growth and the development of the disease. So. Right. So, first of all, do you have any uh, predicted genes that might be involved in this susceptibility uh, for the zebra Z- 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 Um Not really. We can look at a lot of uh, genes that are involved in resistance to and like just medical seed or, uh, you know, the, the 
usual pathway in the resistance for BDD, ATA, things like that. But we don't have any, any kind of difference. But we see, uh, we saw, I did a couple of preliminary after this year to look at uh, some of these genes, and we see a couple of them that are in the type of genes, which is logical. Do you, are you, do you plan on using uh, next generation sequencing or maybe I will. different, different I will. schedules? Ask me if she wants. Ask me if she will try it. Ask me. What proportion of cells carry the bacteria and do you know if it's changing in the populations? Uh, so there is a survey, I don't remember the number of them. <laughs> there is a survey that is conducted, so there are people all over the state of Texas that are harvesting psyllid, and people look at if they are uh, hot or not hot. And I think it's relatively high, but I don't remember the number. Do you know that? Do you have the 50%? Yeah, but that's in the lab. So the, yeah, the, the hot population you are mentoring, that of the oxidic that contains the bacteria, there is always a couple of them that are uh, not hot, so we say between 70 and 90 percent are hot. And uh, we don't know, so the bacteria seems to be transmitted horizontally and vertically. And, uh, and so we don't know why when we go test the population, some seems to not, to not have the bacteria. We have no explanation for that. Do you believe you shift to the Because it appears to be in heat stone. We say that it's a bacteria transmitted by insects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is? No, I haven't seen anything. I don't think they were ready, but. Uh... Does the genome sequence say that they're not very closely related? Mm -hmm. And then, interestingly, you expect the fact that they're transmitted by insects. And so you would expect a certain suite of genes yeah. to be present that enable you to be transmitted by insects. They inhabit a very different uh, environment once they enter the plant, because the xylella is going to enter the xylem. And you think about the, the osmotic pressure, and you think about the composition of nutrients and all those kinds of things, and it's very, very different. And so, they wouldn't necessarily then be expected to have the same sort of suite of genes. Maybe share in their insect uh, association genes, but not their kind genes. There is a, in the liver like that, there is a lot of genes that are involved in ionic transport and specific amino acid transport. And so maybe it's, a, you know, the specificity trends of the bacteria that is. Thank you.